session with Laura Schumann, this time on Hind on Buddhism. And she did great last week, so we're looking really forward to this. And to our people on Zoom, please make sure you put any questions in the chat, and we'll make sure that Laura gets them. Uh, I'd also like to remind everybody that we have another event this week on November 17th at 6.30. We're going to be having a, a dinner party, and the food is free. <laughs> We're going to be viewing this film Sabbath by Martin Dubelman. Dubelman, thank you. And um, Sabbath as a as a spiritual practice, which is something that I don't think we often think about deeply. So we want to try to begin that process. It's a two hour film, but we're going to feed you first. So I'll turn it over to Laura. Thank you. Watchmojo.com. I'm your host Marisa and today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Buddhism. Now did you know that there are over 300 million people worldwide who call themselves Buddhists? Well the religion of Buddhism was founded by the Buddha and it is divided into three schools. There's Theravada, Mahayana and Vajrayana. And the religion emphasizes physical and spiritual discipline. Now the goal of a Buddhist is to attain Nirvana, and this is a state in which one is free of distractions from desire and self-consciousness. Now in order to achieve a state in which the Buddhist aims to end all kinds of suffering, he must train his mind to follow the Noble Eightfold Path, which is actually the fourth part of the Four Noble Truths. Now the Four Noble Truths was actually the first topic of the sermon given by the Buddha after his enlightenment. Now the Four Noble Truths are, existence is suffering, number two, suffering has a cause, namely craving and attachment, Number three, there is a cessation of suffering known as Nirvana. And number four, as you know, is a noble eightfold path. So there you go, folks. Your brief introduction to Buddhism. So, um, Buddhism is known as the middle way of wisdom and compassion. Middle way is important. It's avoiding extremes of life. Um, wisdom is understanding and compassion is empathy for others and i think we'll see how this plays out in as i talk about the life of the buddha buddhism is about 2500 years old um, it began in india but in fact unlike hinduism buddhism spread well beyond india and for the past 1,000 years, it basically has had fizzled out in India and um, only small pockets, really. Um, but it's taken hold in the rest of the Asian world. In fact, a lot of people, uh, when they think Buddhism, they think China. Um, and certainly today, China, despite being officially an atheistic, non-religious nation, um, still has the most Buddhists in the world more than any other nation. Um, some people say Buddhism is a philosophy. Um, it's also identified as a religion, um, but it's very different from most religions because there's no God and there's no worship of the divine being. Well, Buddhism is about as diverse as Christianity and from one end of the scale to the other, um, sometimes it looks like a completely different religion. Um, and it is followed by more than 300 million people. Um, in fact, some of the numbers I've seen more recently have just over 500 million, a half a billion people. It is, in fact, then the fourth largest religion in the world. It is based on the teachings of the Buddha. In fact, it's called Buddhism, not because they worship the Buddha, but because they all aspire I shouldn't say all, they aspire to become Buddha, a Buddha. So we'll talk about what is a Buddha. In fact, Buddhism itself um, identifies with um, what's known as the three refuges or the three jewels of Buddhism. And that serves the good, um, if you will, table of contents for everything Buddhist. Um, the Buddha is the teacher. Um, and this was a reference to the historical Buddha, but also to concepts of a, a heavenly Buddha or becoming a Buddha. Um, the um, Dharma is the teachings of the Buddha. And then 
the Sangha. Sangha is a reference to the Buddhist community, specifically the monastic community, um, which is fairly common amongst Buddhists, at least in Asian cultures, um, but also by extension, any Buddhist community. So we could compare this to, um, if you will, uh, Jesus as the teacher, uh, the Bible as the teachings, and the church as the community. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So we'll start with the Buddha. Um, the Buddha was actually a title that was given to the person who became the first person who became a Buddha, the Buddha. Um, and this is the historical Buddha. Um, his given name at birth was Siddhartha Gautama. Um, and he was born in North, Northeast India um, to a king. So he was born a prince. He was raised in luxury. Um, his traditional dates have him being born in 563 BCE. Um, and he lived a good long life, 80 years. So um, he was, as I said, raised in great luxury um, with anticipation that he would become the next king. Um, but he did have empathy for the suffering of others. And around the age of uh, 29, he rejected his destiny as nobility to become a monastic. Um, now, some of what motivated this, um, he was educated within the castle walls. Um, as a, in his late teens, he was married to a princess in a neighboring village, and um, kind of an arranged marriage. And by the time he was 29, they had a son. Now, I think it's particularly important that to know that he was married and he did have a child, unlike Jesus. Um, so he was living an ordinary human life at this point. Um, and during this time frame in his youth, um, at some point, he wanted to go outside the castle walls to see the people he would one day rule. And um, his father had sheltered him from ordinary life of most folks and the suffering that we all face in life. Um, but his father had arranged so that he'd only see the niceties of life, um, but didn't turn out that way. In his explorations, um, he encountered an old man, um, a sick man, and then a dead man. And he saw the suffering of old age sickness and death and the grieving of those who were left behind. Um, and then he saw a monk. The monk somehow was not suffering. The monk seemed contented with life. So these are the famous four sights. And um, I would say that it was these four sights that really motivated Siddhartha um, to eventually take the monastic life, trying to find out what it is about monastic life that um, has us rise above the suffering of ordinary life. So even though Siddhartha himself was not suffering, given his life of luxury in the castle walls, um, he had empathy for the suffering of others that he had seen in this journey. Um, now, the fact that he waited until he was 29 when his son was born suggests to me that now that he had the next given birth to the next generation, he felt freed from his own responsibility to become the next king that could skip over the generation. And thus, at this early age, he took vows of renunciation. I talked last week in Hinduism, this is the fourth uh, goal of life. Um, so he went from being a householder in the early stages of householder, jumped right over retirement into renunciation. Now, some people think, oh, he was a deadbeat dad. He left his wife and kid. But keep in mind, 2,500 years ago in India, in a noble family, there were probably a lot of servants. And even if he'd stayed within the castle, he probably would not have had as much direct support of his family as we all have in our culture. So I don't think it was a terrible thing. Also in India, 
even today to become a monastic or a holy man is a, a point of great respect um, amongst the people and the families whose parents, who, whose kids do take that path. Um, so once he became this monastic, he followed a very strict ascetic path for about six years. He went from one teacher to another and settled down in this strict asceticism, um, which is a life of extreme denial. So he went from one extreme of great life of great luxury to another extreme of great self-denial. Um, he didn't keep himself clean. He wore rags, if anything. Um, he, he didn't bathe. He barely ate enough to sustain himself. Um, and he just would sit in meditation, the ascetics. Um, and they have no personal possessions. They have no roof over their heads, no home. Uh, they live in the forest. Um, and he lived this way for, apparently for six years, so the stories tell us. Um, and at that point, um, at least one version of version of the the legend, um, a young, beautiful young maiden from a nearby village came to the river, um, and she had a bowl of rice, and she found him there, and she handed him the bowl of rice, and he ate some nourishing food, and he went bathing in the river. And the other ascetics, when they saw him do this, they, they turned their back on him. He had broken his vows. Um, he had interacted with a beautiful young woman, which ascetics don't do, monastics don't do. He had eaten nourishing food, which they don't do. He had cleaned, cleaned himself, which the ascetics don't do. Um, and then Siddhartha determined, though, he hadn't, all this time, he had not found the solution to the problem of suffering. So he determined he was going to sit in med one more meditation. He sat down under a tree. The tree became known as the Bodhi tree. Bodhi um, means wisdom, and it's the same root as Buddha. Um, so the Buddha is one who has gained wisdom or enlightenment. And he sat under that tree. Um, various versions of the story say overnight. Others say for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, and at some point, then he gained this, the light bulb goes off sort of thing and enlightenment. Uh, and um, he had arrived at this state. And that, at the, around the age of 35 then, is when he became the Buddha, which means the awakened one. Um, and then he spent the remaining 45 years of his life teaching others how to achieve the peace of mind that he had found. Uh, so what did the Buddha teach? This then is our second video. The chief problem in life is suffering, and it is caused by desiring worldly things. Suffering can be eliminated by getting rid of material desires. This will help you realize nirvana, the state of bliss characterized by freedom from rebirths. Buddhas do not worship any god. Buddha was not a god, but a person who realized spiritual enlightenment and freedom from the cycle of birth and death. Most Buddhas believe a person has countless rebirths, which leads to suffering. To end these rebirths, the goal of a Buddhist is to purify one's heart and to let go of all yearning and sensual desires and material attachment. Through practice meditation, a person may reach nirvana, the ridding of desires and freedom from reincarnations. So what did the Buddha teach then? So now we move into the second refuge or aspect of Buddhism, the, the Dharma, the teachings. Um, the first teaching is that of the four noble truths. And, and regardless of diversity, this is common to all forms of Buddhism. And it was, in fact, the content of the first sermon that the Buddha gave, he went back to the other ascetics and started teaching with them. Um, to live is to suffer. Um, no one can escape suffering in life. Um, we all grow old. We all aid, uh, get sick. Eventually, we will all die. Um, and there's all sorts of other things that cause us to suffer in life. If there's a problem, under, 
to solve the problem, it helps if you can understand the cause of the problem. So the second noble truth is understanding the cause of suffering. And the Buddha concluded that it is ultimately self-centered desire and attachments that cause us to suffer. Now, I think if we, if we think about this for a bit, if you desire youth, but your body grows old, um, you're going to suffer when you're no longer youthful. Uh, you want something you don't have. If same thing with uh, health and sickness, when you get sick, you desire health. Um, if you don't desire it, then you don't suffer. Um, same thing with death. We all desire life and we all fear death. Um, nobody wants to die and nobody wants to, maybe even more so, nobody wants to lose a loved one, uh, but it's inevitable. So anything we want but don't have causes us to suffer. And the other way as well, anything we don't have that we do want, you want a particular job and you don't get it, you feel down, you suffer. Um, so it works both ways, likes and dislikes. Um, so if we understand that our desires for things we don't have cause us to suffer, what's the next truth? The natural progression here would be, well, if we can eliminate our desires, then we can eliminate our suffering. And this state of mind, and it is a state of mind, desire is a state of mind, and eliminating it's another state of mind is referred to in Buddhism as nirvana. Nirvana is not the Buddhist heaven. It's not where Buddhas go when they die. In fact, the Buddha was asked the question, uh, where does a Buddha go when he dies? And the Buddha answered with another question, metaphorically speaking, um, where does the flame go when you blow out the candle? Anybody care to try to answer that one? It doesn't go anywhere. It just is extinguished. In fact, the word nirvana means to blow out, to extinguish. Um, so in this context, we are first extinguishing our desires and by extension, extinguishing our suffering. And then the fourth truth leads naturally, well, how do we do this? And that becomes the eightfold path. And the eightfold path is the fourth noble truth. And it is essentially the Buddhist way of life. The eightfold path itself consists of three subparts. The wisdom side of this, and remember I said it's the middle way of wisdom and compassion. Um, so wisdom is right understanding, the right understanding of the Four Noble Truths, for instance, and the rest of the Dharma, and right motivation or right thought. Um, our motivation for following the Eightfold Path, our thoughts of anything you would do, first comes thought, then comes speech, then comes action. If you don't have the right thought, your speech will not be right. Your actions will not be right because before we do anything else, we think, what am I going to do? Do it for the right reason. The third, uh, second part of the Eightfold Path is moral discipline. There are three sections here. Moral discipline is right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Right speech would involve not lying, not um, using more words than necessary, you know what they say, two ears, one mouth, listen twice as much as you speak, um, to not slander others and so on and so forth. Um, right action. Um, actually, my next slide will go more in depth on the right actions. It's called the, the five precepts of Buddhism. It's kind of like the Buddhist equivalent of the Ten Commandments. Um, but basically, you don't harm or kill any other living being. Um, and you don't do anything that could bring harm to others. So almost everything you are going to do, you have to have the right thought 
How is this going to impact on others? Um, and then right livelihood. I always think right livelihood is a very telling or interesting aspect of this path. Um, a livelihood is how you earn your living. Now, typically, monastics or ascetics would not be earning a living. They're not working in the world. They're the renunciants. But by incorporating right livelihood into the Eightfold Path, the Buddha is saying um, we can live in this world and still follow a Buddhist path. Make sure that your livelihood isn't breaking the rules of right action and right speech. Um, so being a butcher, for instance, where you have to slaughter animals is not a right livelihood for a Buddhist. Um, going into the military and fighting in, in battles and wars is not a proper or right livelihood for a Buddhist and so on and so forth. So each of these steps is almost informed by the one before it. Mental discipline then becomes a third part of Buddhism. And this is usually, I think, what most people think of when they think of Buddhist practice. Um, it is right effort, right mindfulness, and finally, right meditation or right concentration. Right effort um, is, one might think, well, it's making the right effort to follow the Eightfold Path. But more specifically, it's about um, changing bad habits into good ones. Just because you've gone down the wrong path previously in your life doesn't mean you can't change. Make an effort to change to improve yourself as you move into the future. Um, and right mindfulness is a very distinctive kind of Buddhist meditation practice. Mindfulness is about being in the present moment. Be here now is the tagline. Um, I, I dare say 90% of the time, our minds have, are wandering all over the place. We're thinking about what happened earlier today, or we're thinking about what we're going to do when we leave this place tonight or tomorrow, what's gonna, what we're going to be doing. In the meantime, we're missing out on the present moment. Right mindfulness is, instead of closing off your senses and looking inward, as we talked last time a bit about uh, Hindu meditation practice, um, mindfulness meditation is about being fully aware of what's going on in the moment with all of your senses. Um, if you step outside the door when you leave this room, pause for a moment and feel the crispness of crisp crispness of the fall evening. Um, listen to the sounds in the distance, look up in the sky, and just be there and embrace it. Um, ordinarily, we might be thinking about, okay, there's my car, I'm going to get in and go home. You're thinking about the future, but be present in the moment. And I've observed any number of Buddhist monks who um, they actually do enjoy and embrace life in, in all its mundaneness. Um, I've been to any, it's been or seen any number of Buddhist um, monasteries or, or homes. They don't have big monasteries here, but there's typically a basketball court and the monks will be playing and they smile and they race around with dogs and they just have fun in the moment, enjoying themselves. Um, but not to the exclusion of the other aspects here. Uh, right meditation is the pinnacle of, of meditation. This is the more typical meditation where you look inward. But even here, there's a lot of different um, forms of meditation or, or techniques that have developed amongst various Buddhists. And um, the hardest thing about meditation is silencing your mind. But when I've sat in on Buddhist meditation sessions, it's the, the directions are to observe your mind. Um, and they recognize that your mind will drift during meditation. And they say, that's OK. Notice it's drifting. Come back to center. Thoughts will come into your mind. That's okay. Watch your thoughts come and go as if they were clouds going through the sky. Uh, don't let 
yourself get caught up with them, but and then you get distracted and pulled out if you don't. So you control, you don't control your thoughts. The thoughts don't control you. They're just there. You watch them come, you watch them go, but you remain at a distance. Um, so it's hard meditation that says, stop thinking, stop feeling. That's hard. But the Buddhist meditation is like, okay, if you have an itch, be aware of the itch, but don't let it distract you. It'll, it's there, notice it, kind of analyze it. What does it feel like? But, and then it's not no longer an itch that bothers you. Again, something's bothering you, that's suffering. Itching can make you suffer, right? Um, so the Eightfold Path here, and if, you'll, if you can make out the little symbol here, or the one up in the, in the corner, the upper corner, this is the Wheel of Dharma. This is the classic symbol for Buddhism, and there are eight spokes. And it's kind of like a bicycle wheel. If you took a spoke out, the wheel would collapse. So the Eightfold Path is not a series of things you, you know, you, you um, do one and you get good at that and then you move on to the next step. It's not a series of steps that you go through, but something that you practice all eight of them day in and day out. And this is what the monastic life is about. Um, and when it comes to not desiring, um, interesting little uh, anecdote. Um, I had a student who visited a Buddhist monastery around here. This is decades ago, probably. Um, and she came back to class and reported how um, it was mealtime. Now, the monks don't prepare their own food. Uh, the lay people bring them food every day, and their main meal is at noontime. This is one of the rules for the monastics is they don't eat um, big meals after noon. So, you know, maybe they'll just have some broth or, or drink water or what have you. But so the people bring food. And the people know enough not to bring meat. Uh, but if somebody, if they're begging in, in Asia, they go around with their begging bowls in the morning and people put food in it. They collect the food that way. Um, if somebody had leftover meat that wasn't specifically prepared for the monks, the monks would accept this. Um, the, but the people generally know, don't give the monks meat. But... We also, we all have our preferences, foods that we love and overindulge in, and foods that we don't care for and don't touch. But the monks would take a little bit of everything that was brought, whether they personally like it or not. So again, they're overcoming their likes and dislikes this way. Um, and they don't overindulge in the things they like, and they don't reject anything that's been brought to them out of, out of uh, um, you know, gratefulness, what have you. So um, even just eating their daily meal is another practice of detachment. Um, you're not overly attached to some things or rejecting other things. So they're practicing um, um, eliminating the cause of their, desire, of their suffering by eliminating their desires or overcoming their desires through practice five precepts of Buddhism um, are a part of right speech and right action. Uh, this is the moral discipline that supports elements of the Eightfold Path. And the five precepts are kind of universal. Um, this applies whether for the monastics as well as lay people. Uh, first is do no harm, do not harm or kill other living beings. And do not take what is not given to you. In other words, don't steal. Do not speak unwisely or unskillfully. Uh, do not commit sexual misconduct. Uh, the monastics would be chaste completely, abstinence. But amongst lay Buddhists, um, this would be applied to limiting it within marriage. And do not consume mental intoxicants, no alcohol, no um, mind-altering illicit drugs, um, because again, the mind is the really important thing in Buddhism. I think this may be why Buddhism is so attractive to Western audience, because 
there is a big psychological component in Buddhism. Um, something went through my mind and I forgot it now. Uh, something with the Eightfold Path, what, it'll come back to me. So uh, we talked last time about Bud Hinduism and um, Buddhism, because it started in India, shares some things in common with Hinduism, but it also um, differs from Hinduism. And it differs enough to say it's not a part of Hinduism. It's something new and different. Buddhism grew out of Hinduism the way Christianity grew out of Judaism. Um, and as such, in bo the, both cases, elements of the older religion are still present in the newer religion, but the newer religion is different enough to di have distanced itself and made a name, literally a name for itself. Um, Buddhism rejects the authority of the ancient Vedic texts, which are the core teachings, um, the earliest texts of Hinduism. Um, and anything that thus is part of the Vedic tradition is also naturally rejected. And this would include a rejection of the Vedic caste system and a rejection of the Vedic and Hindu deities. Um, Buddhism doesn't deny, doesn't necessarily deny the existence of such deities, but it, it denies the efficacy of worshiping these deities. In some ways, Buddhism is very much a do-it-yourself kind of spiritual path. Nobody can meditate for you. Um, you have to do it yourself. And you may learn how to do it from the monks, but ultimately it's within yourself to be successful or not. Um, and Buddhism rejects the efficacy of Vedic worship and ritual. Now, this is not to say that some schools of Buddhism developed in the centuries and millennia since the Buddha to in fact be more devotional in nature and to ha have some forms of Buddhism are very ritualistic. I know, hopefully get time to talk a bit about some of those forms. Um, but the original teachings of the Buddha were kind of antithetical to a lot of elements that came out of Hinduism. Um, and the concept of the Brahman, I talked last week about the, in, the singular impersonal ultimate reality that is the, the core of everything Hindu. Um, the, the Hindu idea, understanding of the whole universe being, a, a, if you will, an emanation of the Brahman. Um, Buddhism does not conceive of a singular creator type being or force or energy. In fact, um, the Buddha didn't really teach, Buddhism doesn't have a creation story. One of the few religions or cultures that does not have a creation story. Um, the Buddha, you know, so people wanted to know, well, well, how did things get to be the way they are? How, if desire causes suffering, how did this start? You know, why is there suffering? Western people in religions ask this too. And sometimes it's so troubling that they have to reject the idea of a, an all good, all loving God because of the suffering of the innocent. Um, but Buddha taught, taught a lot through parables and stories. And he used an example here. Um, a man has been shot with an arrow. Now, is he going to insist on knowing who shot him and why and what is the arrow made of before he lets somebody take the arrow out of his chest? No, he just wants to remove it. It doesn't matter how it got there. What's important is how do we get out of this mess? And this is basically the Buddhist view of suffering. Is It's idle speculation about the the you know, beginning of all this. Why is it like this? And how did it get this way? Just to know that it is this way and we don't want it to be this way. And here's how we, what we can do to get out of it. Um, so there's no single ultimate reality. There's no start. We, Buddhism isn't saying there isn't a start. It doesn't say there is a start. It doesn't say what it is or isn't. Buddha just did not speculate on these things, and he encouraged his followers to not waste their mental energy speculating on things we can't know the answer to. 
similarly on the other end of things, what happens when we die, another one of those things where, you know, it's idle speculation. Don't waste your time worrying about those things. Worry about the here and now. And I guess that comes back to the idea of mindfulness. Be here in the present moment. And anything else is just kind of pointless waste of time and energy. Now, I haven't talked about Jainism, but that's another uh, spiritual path or religion of ancient India. It was present at the time of the Buddha. And in fact, those six years of strict ascetic life that Siddhartha pursued before he became the Buddha may in fact have been a practice of Jainism, which is also a very strict ascetic type of religion. But Jainism had teachings that Buddha also rejected. So in the end, Buddhism, uh, Siddhartha was born into a Hindu tradition, rejected that. He tried the Jain spiritual path and rejected that as well, which makes Buddhism stand out as a third ancient religion of India. From Jainism, Buddha rejected the concept of the Atman. Talked about that last week too. The Atman is the individual spirit or soul that is each of us, which is identical with the Brahman. Jainism may reject the Brahman, but it accepts the idea of an eternal spiritual self or, or soul. Um, the Buddha, Buddhism actually talks about no soul or anatta, no atman, um, that there is no eternal unchanging self. And that's a little tidbit. One of my, my students came back from talking to Buddhist monks and after learning about anatta in class, she went and asked the Buddhist monk is there a soul? And she came back to report on the answer and the monk said, yes, there is. Now, I puzzled over this myself. Maybe the monk she talked to wasn't very knowledgeable, um, but maybe what he meant is there's there, if there is a soul, it is not eternal and unchanging. We are constantly changing in every moment of our lives. Um, Buddhism also rejected the practice of strict asceticism and withdrawing from the world, preferring thus the middle way. And again, the life of the Buddha himself um, uh, is an example of this. He tried asceticism for six years in the end, rejecting it and did not encourage his followers to practice that strict asceticism. But to follow the middle way. Now, Buddhism does have monastics, but they do not withdraw from the world. The monastics participate and interact with the lay followers. And Buddhist monasteries are not off in the forests or on the mountaintops. They are in the cities where the people live or on the outskirts of the city so that there can be an exchange between the lay people and the monastics, and there's an interaction between the two on well, a daily basis. The monks go with their begging bowls, or the lay people come to the monastery with the food. Um, so there's that close connection then between the worldly life and yet living apart from it, plunked down in the middle of it, so to speak. Um, and vegetarianism. Um, Jainism is, uh, Jains are very strict vegetarians, more so even than Hindus. Um, vegetarianism for Buddhism is not a requirement. Um, and the fact that Buddhism spread well beyond India into the rest of Asia, um, it had to accommodate itself to those other cultures. And they were eating meat. So um, much like Christianity didn't, demand that the followers of Christ become kosher uh, and follow dietary rules of, of uh, Judaism. So um, some Buddhists choose to be vegetarian because it's an easy way to avoid harming other living beings. Um, but I noted earlier that if somebody does provide meat to the monks, as long as the monks know it was not prepared specifically for them, they, will, they won't reject it. Uh, so, um,
So if that's what Buddhism rejects from the other two religions, what is it that it accepts? What does it share in common with them? What do Buddhists believe? Um, Buddhists, uh, gee, generally accept the idea of rebirth or what might be called reincarnation, although they tend not to call it that because they don't believe in a soul or a transmigration of souls. Uh, you can't have a, you know, picking up the soul from one body and plunking it down in another lifetime after lifetime. That's not the Buddhist idea of rebirth, but that we are almost reborn every day. Every life experience changes us in some way, and death and birth are just more life experiences. And each life experience leads naturally and progressively to the next. So this is the process of rebirth. But now I've come across Buddhists who say they don't believe in reincarnation. Buddhism does not believe in reincarnation. Um, I'm not sure if they're having an issue with the word reincarnation versus rebirth, or if, in fact, because there's no soul, there can't be reincarnation. I, I'm, I still don't fully understand why some Buddhists say that, no, there's no reincarnation, and others talk about rebirth. But um, basically, rebirth results from our attachments, which is the Buddhist equivalent of karma. If you are attached to life in this world, you come back to life in this world. Um, so detachment, particularly detachment from worldly life, is one way to move toward nirvana or para-nirvana, the ultimate nirvana, the ultimate blowing out of self. Basically, self, the idea of self is an illusion or a construct of the mind, we'll put it that way. Uh, nirvana is a peaceful, detached state of mind. Um, ultimate nirvana, which is what, what happened to a Buddha when he dies, well, at least in the, in, in the person of Siddhartha Gautama, he ceased to exist in any way, shape, or form, and therefore Buddhists do not worship the Buddha because he doesn't exist anymore. But he did... There, there are plenty of texts and stories where the Buddha had previous lives, and it talks about his previous lives, not just as, as previous humans, but in the form of monkeys and such. Um, whether these are taken literally or figuratively, that probably varies from one Buddhist to another. Um, but there are texts that do talk about the rebirth leading up to the last life of the Buddha in the form of Siddhartha Gautama. So clearly the idea of rebirth is present in these Buddhist texts anyway. Uh, achieving nirvana means escaping from the cycle of rebirth or samsara. Um, nirvana is basically the Buddhist equivalent of what is moksha in Hinduism, which I talked about last time. Now, once Gautama Buddha died, the historical Buddha, after 80 years of life in this world, Having achieved nirvana and teaching multitudes his way of life, he ceased to exist as a distinct being. Um, sometimes, you know, nirvana is a really hard concept to explain because even the Buddha himself avoided explaining it. Um, there are passages and texts that talk about how it is neither being nor non being, it is neither birth nor death. And it, it sounds very paradoxical. Um, this is what gives me an impression. Nirvana is something you won't understand until you experience it for yourself. And in the process of coming to that understanding, words cannot do it justice. So um, again, it's one of the, another one of those things you can't teach that to somebody else. You have to discover it yourself sort of thing. Uh, so Buddhism is a non-theistic religion. Uh, the Buddha is not to be mistaken for the Buddhist God. There is no Buddhist God, but he is a revered teacher. And in fact, that Buddhists everywhere take refuge in the Buddha 
suggests how important the historical Buddha is for all these Buddhist paths, even if he no longer exists. Um, in fact, they say his teachings are more important than his being. Um, and, and there's an analogy, Buddhist Jews, um, the Buddha is like a doctor who diagnoses a problem. This is the problem of suffering that the Buddha has diagnosed and um, provides a prescription that's the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. Um, and so that's the teachings, the Dharma. And in turn, the uh, Sangha, the community, is like the nurses who help us take the medicine so we can get better. But ultimately, it's the medicine that cures us. It is the teachings applied by us in our lives that solves our problem. You can't just turn to the Buddha and say, take my problems away, and poof, they're gone. So in this way, it's very different from Christianity, where you turn to Christ, and Christ saves us. The Buddha does not save us. It is the teachings of the Buddha that can save us, providing we apply them. And it is the monastics who help us understand how to apply those teachings. The three marks of existence is another big thing in basic Buddhist teachings. Dukkha is the word for suffering. The first noble truth is dukkha. Life in this world is filled with suffering. That is just a fact of existence. Um, anika is a word that means impermanence. Everything in this world is impermanent. Nothing lasts forever. And I think, you know, it doesn't take too much thought to realize this is the truth. Um, and this is why if we are attached to things that don't last, inevitably sooner or later those things are gone from our life but we're still mentally attached to them emotionally attached to them and that is why we suffer so remain detached be in the present moment accept what life gives us and when life takes it accept that and you can relieve your suffering and then anatta the concept of no self i mentioned a bit earlier the self or soul is also impermanent. There is no eternal, unchanging self. Um, anatta translates as no soul or no atman. Um, so again, if you are attached to your sense of ego and your idea of eternal existence, um, well, then that is basically a delusion. Um, but that attachment continues. This is really hard to, to comprehend. Because you're attached to the sense of self, your sense of self continues. But self is an illusion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've come up with any number of analogies. Um, one is that of a tree. What is a tree? What makes a tree a tree? It's got a trunk, it's got roots, it's got bark, it's got branches, it's got leaves, except in the fall and the winter. But, you know, losing the leaves doesn't mean it's no longer a tree. But what if you took a chainsaw to that tree and chopped it up? All of those parts still exist, but the tree no longer exists. So in a sense, um, Buddhism metaphysics talks about... Um, the constituent parts that make us who we are. And there are five classic parts, they call them skandhas. There is the physical form, there is sense perception, um, there is um, a consciousness, there are feelings, there's mental um, intellect. And when you combine all of these five parts, you are you, but no one of those parts is any more you than any other part. And the end of one life is like the, the separation of all those parts, but the parts like the parts of the tree may continue to exist and then can recombine in a next life. Um, and thus, while there can be a rebirth um, in that sense, 
it's not the same you you used to be. Um, we are the sum total of our life experiences, no more and no less. That's how Buddhists might put it. Um, maybe you can do this with, with other examples. Um, a sports team from generation to generation, all of the players can be different. The owner can be different. Um, at what? But it's still the same team. Or is it? So it's a gradual transition from one to the next, but the team doesn't cease to exist, even though it's completely changed. Suffering is a state of mind. And if we can achieve a balanced, peaceful, detached state of mind, suffering can be extinguished, thus nirvana extinguished, low noun. Um, these teachings are contained in various Buddhist texts. Um, the first and earliest collection of texts is referred to as the Tripitaka, or Three Baskets, um, otherwise known as the Pali Canon, because Pali was the language that was common in the Buddha's day, and that is the language he taught in and the language that ultimately his teachings were written down. Um, and Tripitaka translates as Three Baskets, as the, um, within the first couple hundred years after the Buddha, um, the monastics got together and took a, what was previously oral transmission and wrote it down and collected the teachings in three different baskets for three different kinds of teachings. There is the Vinaya or the discipline, the rules for monastic life. And there are not just five precepts, but hundreds of precepts that the monks are supposed to live by. Five is just applies to everybody, monastic or not. Um, the sutta or sutra discourses of the Buddha. These are the Buddha's sermons, his own words, whether they were parables or, or more metaphysical, philosophical type teachings. Um, <clears throat> this would be the equivalent of the red letters in the New Testament and the Gospels. <clears throat> um, and then there is the Abhidhamma. Dhamma, again, and Dharma is teachings. Um, these are the metaphysical teachings, some of which I've already reviewed with you all. Um, these are the, kind of the extrapolation from the sutras of what this all means. The Dhammapada is another collection. Um, this is a collection of sayings of the Buddha. In fact, I have a copy of that here. Um, it's a rather slim volume. 26 very short chapters. And as with the Bhagavad Gita from last week, you could read this in an evening. You could ponder it for a lifetime or multiple lifetimes as the case were. Um, and just to point out how important the mind is, it's mentioned so many times in this text. In fact, the very first two verses emphasize the power and importance of the mind and controlling the mind. What we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday and our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. If a man speaks or acts with an impure mind, suffering follows him as the wheel of the cart follows the beast that draws the cart. Verse two, what we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday. That's kind of a Buddhist understanding of karma, the past creates the present, the present creates the future. Um, our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. It starts out exactly the same. The second part of the verse is different. If a man speaks or acts with a pure mind, joy follows him as his own shadow. So right from the race talk, start, it talks about the mind and countless passages within this text talk about the mind. Um, there are other texts that are used by specific schools of Buddhism, and I will talk about those schools in a bit. Um, this, uh, the schools of Buddhism are thus the Sangha, the third part of Buddhism. The spread of Buddhism out of India into the rest of Asia um, started to spread a few hundred years after the Buddha, um, when uh, King Ashoka of India um, 
was found Buddhism appealing, and he encouraged the monks to go abroad on missions. Buddhism is, in fact, the th one of three great missionary religions, historically the first, um, but Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam have all sought to spread its message well beyond the, the, the peoples and the place where it started. Um, in contrast, Hinduism and Judaism remain specific to a particular people, um, which is one reason why Judaism is small um, and why Hinduism is 90% still in India. But Buddhism ceased to exist in India. Perhaps no, nobody's really clear as to why. There are many theories on this, one of which is that Hinduism, as it continues to develop over time, incorporated elements of Buddhism. Meditation may exist in Hinduism because Hinduism picked it up from, and, and brought it into it from Buddhism. Um, but uh, within two centuries after the Buddha, Buddhism began to spread north and east into the rest of Asia. Um, by the 13th century, Buddhism had disappeared from India. And another reason is because by that time, Islam had come into India and may in fact have pushed Buddhism further east as Hindu Islam itself moved eastward from the Western or the Near East. There are several schools of Buddhism. The first video we saw went through these really quickly. Um, Theravada Buddhism is the oldest, earliest form of Buddhism to develop. It's thus generally viewed as most closely connected to the original teachings of the Buddha. In Theravada translates as the way of the elders. Um, not to be mistaken for Buddhism for old people, as one of my Nova students once suggested, um, but the elders as being sort of like the fathers of the church, the earliest um, leaders of the community, the monastics. Um, sometimes it's been referred to as the small vehicle or Hinayana, but that's kind of a derogatory term that the great vehicle refers to it by. Um, Theravada Buddhism would never refer to itself as Hinayana, suggesting it's small and insignificant. Uh, as I said, it is the oldest school of Buddhism to have developed. It's found primarily in Southern Asia. So um, Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, et cetera. Um, if I can kind of figure out how to go backward. If we look at this map, you'll see the dark brown. That's the area of Theravada Buddhism. And the ochre, the larger area, that's then the Mahayana school of Buddhism. Just so you get a visual of, of Asia. Um, monasticism is a big thing in Theravada Buddhism. Um, it's, it's the ideal for achieving nirvana. Um, there are monastics throughout the Theravada cultures, and they're not necessarily monastics for life. A lot of families will send their teenage boys to a monastery, um, maybe keeps them from being overly rambunctious. Uh, maybe the boys will choose to live monastic life in, into their older age. Um, but many of them may just be there temporarily for a few years. Um, and then um, in the rainy season, it would not be uncommon for uh, people, men in particular, to take temporary monastic vows. You know, rainy season, you can't work your fields. What are you going to do while you wait for the rains to end? You can go to a monastery. Good opportunity for temporary monastic practice. And again, maybe you'll choose to stay or come back at some point in the future. Um, and others choose the monastic life for life. Um, Theravada Buddhism could be thought of as a do-it-yourself approach to enlightenment. Um, the interesting thing about Theravada Buddhism being called the small vehicle, even though it's derogatory, 
is to think of it as sort of a motorcycle. You drive yourself. Or the classic um, Buddhist, before there were motorcycles, there were rafts that crossed the river. And this is, this is uh, an imagery that, that comes from some of the earliest teachings of Buddhism, perhaps from the Buddha himself, that we are on the shore of samsara, the realm of rebirth, and the realm of nirvana is on the other shore. And we have to cross a river to get there. And so we need a vehicle or a raft, or ferry boat, if you will, to get there. <coughs> In fact, these schools of Buddhism are often referred to as vehicles or ayana. So hinayana, small vehicle, mahayana, large vehicle. Um, so as a small vehicle, a motorcycle, only one person. And the Buddhist imagery of a raft is you build your own raft to cross the river. Um, in contrast, Mahayana is saying, well, you just go a mile down the river, and some guy's got a big boat already built, and he'll take you across for free. Um, so why go through all the work of doing it yourself when somebody else has already done the work? And we'll see when I talk about Mahayana, how it differs from Theravada. Um, the focus in Theravada Buddhism can be said to be on wisdom and meditation. Meditation practice is really important in Theravada Buddhism. And um, the wisdom side of, if wisdom is one side of the coin, compassion is the other side, wisdom is, is the first. And when you gain wisdom, you naturally become more compassionate toward others. Um, we'll see again how Mahayana is almost the exact opposite here. You work on compassion and wisdom takes a, a, a back seat to that. Compassion is the more important thing. Um, the goal of Theravada Buddhism is to become a Buddha, um, which means you achieve nirvana. And this is then you, you, your final detachment is to detach from the cycle of rebirth. And what happens to a Buddha when he dies? Who knows? Uh, but you've escaped the realm of suffering, of dukkha. Um, Theravada Buddhism is fairly unified in belief and practice. Um, there are cultural differences from one, you know, one, one uh, nation to another where Theravada relies as Laotian and, and uh, um, Thai Buddhism and such, but it's all basically Theravada. Um, here in the States, where people have migrated from all of these different Asian lands, the form of Buddhism is, um, they, they generally have their own uh, monasteries or temples that they've built that are culturally bound. So there's Korean Buddhism and there's, well, that's Bubi Mahayana, but there's, there's Laotian and there's Thai, and it's all the people from those cultures gravitate toward that community so they they speak that language the monks from their homelands have come to serve the lay population that's migrated here so there's somewhat of a language barrier that limits the interaction between one group of Theravada Buddhists and another but from our western perspective we wouldn't be able to tell the difference um, if I wanted to compare the schools of Buddhism to the different major sects of Christianity I might compare Theravada to, um, I want to say Catholicism because it's the earliest to have developed in contrast to Protestant. But on the other hand, because it tends to be culturally or, or nationally bound to different groups, we could also perhaps compare it to Orthodox Christianity, which it te also tends to be nationally bound, Greek and Russian and so on and so forth. Um, the other major school of Buddhism then is Mahayana, which translates as the great vehicle. And they say it's great. Well, it is great because it covers a greater region. If you'll remember the image, I went back to show you again, the, the lighter color is just a greater geographic region. But as such, it's also greater because it, there's more people I mean, China itself is Mahayana, and that's had the most Buddhists of any nation, um, and also includes Korea and Japan in this. 
So the Buddhisms of those three big Asian cultures are uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Um, but they say it's great because a greater number of people can achieve nirvana through it, as opposed to Theravada. Mahayana Buddhism developed around the first century CE, uh, about five, 600 years after the Buddha, as Buddhism continued gradually to move further and further away from India. At first it came to South Asia and then it moved further north and further eastward into China and so on. So um, it just took time for it to migrate. And I'm guessing that as it migrated, it well, I'm not guessing, it did. It picked up elements. What, what makes it different from one place to another is the elements of the indigenous philosophies and practices that were incorporated into it. Um, and again, not unlike Christianity, which as it grew throughout the Roman Empire, um, Greek culture and Roman culture and, and values and practices and, and elements of those cultures in the pagan culture of pre-Christian Europe were all kind of incorporated into Christianity, um, you know, superimposing Christian ideas on top of these earlier practices, um, much the same way Buddhism incorporated Buddhist ideas on the indigenous practices. You can't change the people, but just change the meaning of what they do. Okay. So, um, Mahayana Buddhism is found in Northern Asia, so China, Japan, Korea, and such. Um, Mahayana Buddhism is focused more on the lay Buddhist community as opposed to the monastic community of Theravada. Now, there are lay followers in Theravada Buddhism, but the understanding is unless you live the monastic life, you're probably not going to achieve nirvana. Mahayana Buddhism says anybody can achieve nirvana. It doesn't hinge on being a monastic. Um, there are avenues for lay followers to achieve nirvana. And thus, some of the unique subgroups of Mahayana Buddhism developed to appeal to a lay audience. Um, so we could say this is Buddhism for the masses. And again, the, the analogy of a ferry boat down the river that's been built by somebody else and they'll do a cross in a modern parlance instead of a motorcycle, it's a bus. Um, and one of these approaches for the lay population developed into a more devotional form of Buddhism. So although the Buddha is not a god, and the Buddha himself is still generally not an object of devotion and not a god, not an object of worship, um, they did develop other an idea of other spiritual beings who can help you. Those other spiritual beings aren't gods themselves, but um, more equivalent to saints in a Christian context. Um, these heavenly Buddhas or bodhisattvas, um, so we break that word down. Bodhi means wisdom. We saw that with the Bodhi tree and the root word of Buddha is Bodhi. Uh, sattva or sat translates generally as a being or existence or truth. So a Buddha is just enlightened or awakened. Well, a bodhisattva is an awakened being. Uh, in fact, technically, um, Siddhartha Gautama or Gautama Buddha, while he was still living alive on earth in his 80 years of life here, was technically a bodhisattva. He was a wise being. And when he when his body gave up its its ghost, shall we say, gave up its life, um, he was no longer a being. It was just sort of a disembodied wisdom, if you will. Um, but uh, Mahayana Buddhism developed this concept that not only is there the Buddha, there are also bodhisattvas. And out of compassion for the suffering of others, um, Mahayana Buddhism has a goal not of becoming a Buddha, but becoming a bodhisattva. Um, some of these wise beings, heavenly Buddhas um, in China, Kuan Yin is very popular. 
in Japan, it's Amida Buddha. Um, and while the word Buddha and Bodhisattva are often used interchangeably, technically these are Bodhisattvas and not Buddhas. Um, so um, Kuan Yin is the Bodhisattva of mercy and compassion. Um, I have an image of her down here in the lower right corner. Um, you may not see it in the images, but you'll see statues, larger than life statues outside um, the, these uh, uh, Mahayana temples. And she has a flask that she holds in her right hand and it's pointing downward. And the flask contains mercy and compassion. And so pointing downward, it's flowing out down to the rest of us. And another uh, common image is that of a lotus flower. I think throughout Buddhism, a lotus flower is featured prominently as symbols. But in Mahayana Buddhism, the lotus is a, uh, a pond uh, plant, lily of sorts. It's, it's rooted down in the muck and mire, the depths of the pond, and it grows up on a long stalk and blooms at the surface into countless petals. And those countless petals are said to represent all the potential Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And every one of us is a potential Buddha and Bodhisattva. We have what they call the Buddha nature within. Now, these are all unique to Ma teachings to Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and the text that Mahayana Buddhism embraces, um, it's not so much the Tripitaka as sutras that did not make the cut in the Tripitaka, but they say those sutras also came from the Buddha. Um, one may debate if they did or not, or were written later by teachers within Mahayana Buddhism, but um, they're attributed to Buddha just as much by Mahayana. Um, so um, we should all blossom like the lotus flower. And because the lotus flower is still rooted in the muck and mire at the bottom of the pond, this world we're living in is that muck and mire. So Mahayana Buddhism is saying we can still be in this world, but rise above it the way the lotus flower does. Um, and that's why we don't have to become monastics. We can still be rooted in this world and not separate ourselves by going to a monastery and living there. Uh, the focus is on compassion. Again, the bodhisattva is one who, the bodhisattva ideal or the bodhisattva vow common in Mahayana, um, the vow to become a bodhisattva before one becomes a Buddha, to remain a bodhisattva out of the compassion for the suffering of others who have not gone that far, because you can't help others achieve their nirvana if you're not here, if you are not a being here in the world with them. Now, here in the world doesn't necessarily mean physically in the world, it can mean in other realms of existence, but still within samsara. And thus, why well, I kind of equate it to saints that we can turn to for assistance and guidance. Um, now, just as in Christianity, those saints are not God. Sometimes we pray to saints almost instead of God, because the saints will want us. They know what we're going through. Um, and so, too, with the bodhisattvas. Um, they're closer to us. So out of compassion, the bodhisattva remains within the rounds of rebirth. They choose. They could, if they wanted to, move on to a full nirvana like the Buddha did. But the bodhisattvas, out of compassion for the suffering of the rest of us, remain here um, or there. Um, Buddhism does have this idea of realms of existence. There are six realms, and in some cases, actually, those six are subdivided into another six of so this 36 realms of existence. Um, one of the six realms is the world of humans. There's animals, and there are heavenly realms where the gods reside, um, or the heroes. Um, and then there are hellish realms. So depending on, I guess, what kind of life you've lived determines which kind of realm you are worthy of in your next life. And this, again, is the Buddhist idea of, of uh, rebirth based on karma. 
Um, so the goal in my Hindu Buddhism then is to become a bodhisattva so as to assist others toward enlightenment and thus the bodhisattva ideal. So deciding with compassion as a primary motivating force within my Hana versus seeking of wisdom as the primary motivating force within Theravada. And it's these bodhisattvas who would be driving the bus or running the ferry, as it were. Um, there have developed a number of diverse sub-schools or sects within Mahana Buddhism. Um, there's Pure Land Buddhism, um, which is most popular uh, in, in uh, Japan. Uh, Nichiren, Tendai, Shingyan, various others. Um, I, I think almost all of these are present in Japan. Um, many of them, some of them came to Japan from China, others developed in Japan. Um, and they all have their kind of different angles. Pure Land Buddhism, um, there's one very well-known Buddhist temple in Northern Virginia, um, the Ikoji Buddhist Temple in uh, Fairfax Station. And uh, that's a Pure Land Japanese Buddhism. Uh, and they, uh, their focus of uh, Bodhisattva is specifically Amida Buddha or Amitabha Buddha. And Pure Land Buddhism is about making praise to Amida Buddha. And in so doing, Amida Buddha will usher you into the Pure Land when you die. Now, the Pure Land is, sounds a lot like the idea of heaven, but it's not the final resting place in Pure Land Buddhism. It's just a place from which nirvana will be easier to achieve than it is here. Um, and Amida Buddha presides in the Pure Land. Um, so if you just um, have faith in Amida Buddha, uh, utter praise to Amida Buddha, that is all you need to do. You don't need to practice the, the monastic life and all the hardships of monasticism. That's why it's a particularly focused lay Buddhist community. Um, and uh, it actually is part of the official Buddhist churches of America, which is like 100 years old and started in California when the Japanese migrated to here, of course, the Pacific. Um, and then it spread, and there are Koji Buddhist temples in other cities, this one in Richmond. Um, so they're all kind of modeled that way. And the Buddhist churches in America specifically modeled itself after Protestant Christianity, which was prevalent here in America. Um, and unlike most Buddhist temples, even here, um, Ikoji temples are set up with chairs just like this in a row, and there's an altar up front. Um, the practices are distinctly Buddhist rather than Christian, but the appearance is more of a Protestant. And so that particular church has appealed a lot to Western converts to Buddhism. Um, they have about as many Western followers in that temple as they have uh, Japanese. And you can see them both on Sunday mornings. Um, Buddhism doesn't have a specific time or day or of the week or what have you that they worship. Actually, in Asian cultures, they tend to be full moons and new moons that they focus on communal gatherings. But, um, you know, a place like Ikoji Buddhist does Dharma school for kids, and then they have um, the, the Sunday service. But they also have Thursday evening meditation sessions that are modeled after Zen Buddhism, which I will also talk about a bit. Um, some of these other schools of Buddhism focus on ritual as opposed to devotion. Um, Nichiren developed in Japan and was a particularly nationalistic movement. Uh, Nichiren was the name of the founder of this school of Buddhism. And um, not how many hundreds of years ago he, he was around, but um, he tended to preach that all other schools of Buddhism were stepping stones to the pinnacle that is Nichiren. And because it had kind of a superiority, um, you know, we're the best kind of thing, it wasn't well received in Japan. Uh, but because it's also very nationalistic to Japan, it was well received. 
so it, in in over the years it's gone through various um, approaches being more or less accepted. Um, Nichiren had an offshoot that was specifically geared toward um, a Western audience, um, Soka Gakkai, um, which is an international version of Nichiren, and uh, Soka Gakkai um, and Nichiren, that's, that's the school that uh, Oprah Winfrey followed. And they, they have their own chant, which I don't pretend to know how to pronounce. Um, um, Ring. No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I've, I've been to some, uh, one of their um, communities here. And uh, one of the, the Western followers there was telling, basically giving his testimony about how he found Nichiren and, and how it, it solved the problems in his life once he adopted it, that kind of thing. It's just the sort of kind of added to the perspective you hear from evangelical Christians, actually. So very interesting to see these same parallels in completely different religion. Um, then we have Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana. Vajrayana is, translates as the diamond vehicle or the thunderbolt vehicle. Um, Vajra is a jewel, and Yana, again, is vehicle. Um, you know, I want to talk about these vehicles again. When you, your car is a vehicle, it helps you to get from one place to another. But when you get where you're going, you leave it behind. So by saying Buddhist schools are vehicles that help us to get from the shore of samsara to the shore of nirvana, the ultimate detachment is to detach from the vehicle you use to get there. Um, at any rate, the uh, diamond vehicle is um, distinct practices of Tibetan Buddhism. It's very steeped in ritual and symbolism. Um, this mandala I have here is a representation from Tibetan Buddhism. Um, a lot of visual art and chanting and things like prayer flags and prayer wheels, which Vajrayana is said to incorporate both elements of Theravada and Mahayana. Um, sometimes it's lumped in with Mahayana Buddhism, but I think it's more distinct enough to call it a third school of Buddhism, as, as our first video did. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism developed around the 7th century CE um, as Buddhism... Um, developed in Tibetan culture, and it incorporated elements of the pre-Buddhist Tibetan indigenous religion of Bon, which was very ritualistic, and some of the um, familiar terminology like Lama actually come directly from Bon. Lama is, is their religious teachers, uh, and the use of ritual comes as much from Bon tradition as it does from tantric practices that came out of ancient India. Um, this is that it's kind of a mix of Theravada and Mahayana. It um, focuses on monasticism. Um, the rituals of Tantra, um, which basically Tantra just means ritual school, um, mandalas or chanting. And chanting is common throughout various Buddhist schools, but in particular, the Tibetan Buddhist chanting is, is very distinctive um, and almost haunting. And it kind of has a meditative, it's a repetitive kind of thing. So it uh, kind of puts you into an almost hypnotic if, or meditative state just by hearing it. Uh, mandalas and tankas are the visual symbolic images. Uh, the tankas are images of the various um, bodhisattvas um, and, and other heavenly Buddhas or beings. Um, the mandala, mandala means circle sim, or symbolic circle. And as you can see here, the monks, there are monks who specialize in chanting. There are other monks that specialize in creating the mandalas. And they spend years learning how to create these with sands and they create it on the ground. They may be a few feet or Many feet in diameter could take days or weeks even to create them. And then they destroy them in a flash. And that's an act of, the creating it is an act of meditation. 
the watching it being made can be meditative. And the destruction is the practice of detachment. You know, we make beautiful works of art and put them on our walls and to de we would never desecrate them. But these are designed to be de de dissolved as quickly or even more quickly than they were took to make. Um, the colors are very distinctive. There's always the same four colors, red, green, yellow, um, blue, black, and white. Uh, and it represents the whole universe and the disillusion of the universe. Um, well, there's a lot more to it, but I don't want to take up too much more time doing that. Um, mudras are symbolic hand gestures. Um, they do believe in bodhisattvas like the Mahayana. Um, the living lamas like the Dalai Lama are human bodhisattvas that are reborn. Life after we have now the 14th Dalai Lama, 14th in a lineage. When one dies, the next is reborn. And uh, the practice of meditation, monasticism, um, which are more similar to Theravada Buddhist practices. And the focus here is on both wisdom and compassion, almost 50 50, equally important. So we can see how both those other schools of Buddhism are incorporated in Tibetan. Uh, the Bardo Thodol, or the Tibetan Book of the Dead, stems from Tibetan Buddhism. And it's actually a ritual that is chanted um, while somebody is approaching death and for a period of, I think it's 49 days after death. And the idea is that the last thing on your mind when you're dying will direct where you're going in the afterlife. So the chanting of this is supposed to lead a person toward their para nirvana as opposed to rebirth. And even during the after death phase, um, the continued chanting on their behalf is with the hopes that this will help them to move on beyond samsara. And if it doesn't, as they get up toward the end of the 49 days, it will at least help them to choose their next womb, as they would say. Um, and last, uh, we have Zen Buddhism. Now, Zen is uh, popular, particularly in Japan, but Zen means meditation. It is the meditation school of Buddhism, and meditation practice comes right out of India, where it was called jhana. When meditation practice through Buddhism moved into China, the Chinese call, called it chan, and when it moved from China into Japan, it became Zen. Uh, so it means meditation, no matter how you pronounce it. Um, this is both a lay and monastic school of Buddhism. Technically, it probably falls under Mahayana because it is common in China and Japan. Um, but sometimes it's treated as its own unique school of Buddhism. Um, Zen seeks sudden enlightenment or satori through meditation practice, arriving in a state of emptiness um, or sunyata so that the Buddha nature can flower forth. Um, and uh, they use meditation masters or roshi to help guide people through the meditation and um, koans, these paradoxical riddles that serve to confound reason, um, moving beyond reason toward intuition is more of the Zen approach to enlightenment. Um, what is this? This is the sound of two hands clapping. What is the sound of one hand clapping as a classic Zen koan? Uh, beauty, the arts, the aesthetics, all sort of the, the right brain stuff, if we still talk about right brain, left brain, um, getting away from logic and reason toward feeling and intuition are all ways of generating a meditative state. Um, gardening, archery, tea ceremony, calligraphy, all of these are elements that are closely linked toward Zen practice. And then we can talk about Buddhism in the West, and I'll leave you with this. So I talked a bit earlier about Western converts. Um, over the first, the, the last couple of centuries, and especially since the latter half of the 20th century, 
um, Buddhism has made inroads into the Western world in two very distinct ways. Um, one is through the immigration of Asian peoples into this uh, land, who brought the diverse forms of Buddhism to the West. We have elements of Tibetan and Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism all side by side, but not really interacting with each other. While in Asian cultures, they tend to be linked to specific geographical reasons. So we've incorporated all of these through the immigrant communities. And then Westerners who have found Buddhism through those communities and essentially adopted meditation practices and the philosophy of Buddhism, if not the more devotional forms. Um, it, and it's the Western Buddhists who are often the ones to say, it's not a religion, it's a way of life, or it's a philosophy. And in many cases, they can, the Western followers tend continue to follow their Western religion, whether it be Christianity or Judaism, but they also have incorporated Buddhist practices and meditation into their um, spiritual lives. Um, Jews are often referred to as Jubus, they're Jewish Buddhists. Uh, so many of these Western followers remain within their own faith traditions, as I said, um, and they find Buddhism to be more of a complement than a conflict with the Western religions that they also follow. Um, so that's because Buddhism doesn't have a God doesn't mean you can't worship a God if you don't want to, um, and uh, things like this. And if you say it's not a religion, it's a philosophy and a way of life, you can still have a religion on one hand and the philosophy and way of life on the other hand. Uh, and because of the language barrier of a lot of the immigrant Buddhist communities, the Westerners have often created their own Western communities and the Eastern and the Western forms of Buddhism can be side by side and not really interact with each other because of the language barrier of the immigrant communities. Um, except for a Koji Buddhist, that's, that's the big exception here. So um, that's basically the end of my presentation. I did run a little longer than I wanted to, but a um, little few minute, few minutes for questions, and then uh, we can kind of break into small groups and talk about what we've learned. Are there any questions? From Zoom or here? When the people here are broken into small groups chatting, I'll check the chat in Zoom and, and see if there's anything to respond to. Well, you answered one of my questions all along. I'm thinking, I feel a lot of what you were saying about Buddhists and the philosophy and everything, and but yet I, I felt almost like I was turning my back on my own religion. I lived in Thailand for a long time and I felt good, you know, when I saw these precepts and I felt the meditation and what have you. So I'm really glad when you said that you can be Christian, but still follow the Buddhist way. And that made me feel good. Thanks. Any other questions? Do we have questions from Zoom? You're welcome. Okay, thank you, very interesting, thank you. <laughs> so as last time, um, hopefully you got another handout with the two questions, same two questions, but this time geared toward Buddhism. Um, just think about and, and jot down what is one or more things you learned about Buddhism that most surprised or interested you. I think you just shared one. Um, and how might you compare and contrast this religion with your own? I know I make comparisons as I go along, um, but maybe, you know, you observed some things I didn't mention. And, uh, you know, take a couple minutes to jot down your thoughts, and then you can pair up and, and share with each other. And while you all are doing that, I'll check into the Zoom session. 
I would note that there are two commercial films I'd recommend watching if 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 you want to uh, um, learn more about Buddhism. One is um, Kundun, which is the a docu drama about the early life of the Dalai Lama from the time when he was two years old and discovered to be the next Dalai Lama until um, and his, until like the late uh, around 1950 when the Chinese exiled the Tibetans from from their homeland. Um, and then the other is um, a more fun little film called Little Buddha. And it features a contemporary American family that where the, the nine-year-old boy was identified as a reincarnate of the, their Lama, uh, not the Dalai Lama, but other Lama. And um, so both of them are from tradition, a Tibetan Buddhist tradition featured. Um, but in the, the, this boy and his family didn't know anything about Buddhism. So when the monks found him, the context of the story for the sake of the audience, as well as the boy's family, the monks are retelling the life story of the Buddha in this film. And there are a bunch of flashback scenes. Uh, so it's like a, a story within a story. And um, who is it that plays the Buddha in that movie? That's yes, pre-Matrix Keanu Reeves plays the Buddha in that story. <laughs> um, so those are two movies about that feature Buddhism prominently. Uh, there's a third one that people sometimes reference, which is Seven Years in Tibet. I do not recommend that if you want to learn about Buddhism. I often compare that to Ben-Hur. <laughs> and that that's also Tibetan Buddhism. But in that film, the Dalai Lama is like a minor sub-character in the way that Jesus is a minor sub-character in Ben-Hur. Um, so, yeah. Well, Laura, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting presentation this evening. You're welcome. Um, thank you for all our Zoom guests. And I'm particularly looking forward to next Tuesday, where we're going to talk about Sikhism, which is one of the lesser known faiths of India. And I think it's also one of the more interesting ones. So that's my personal opinion. So you can take it or leave it. But anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. You're welcome.